Welcome back. So for those who just joined us, we are here at the Global Marketing Day. My name is Fernando Angulo, and I'm going to be hosting the rest of the London sessions. And of course, I've been working for Racing Brass since 2007. It's going to be a, a long time uh, in, in the market for me. And I have several, several uh, experts, really good companies uh, here in the studio, as for example, uh, as you can see, Lego, we have uh, CNBC, we have Microsoft as well with us, and we have a lot, a lot of content for you. And just be tuned. If you have any questions, if you, if you have any comments, you can leave it on globalmarketingday.com. Or if you're on YouTube or if you're on Twitter, just use our hashtag. It's Global Marketing Day. And let's start with our experts, with our guests. We have here several, several uh, people that are coming uh, to our studios. We started in Sydney, now is the part of the second half in the Lon uh, London studio. Kicking off the second half, we have here with us James Murray, uh, product, product Marketing Manager at Microsoft. Uh, he's resp responsible for uh, the refining the branding and positioning of uh, all over Europe. Mm -hmm. That's yep. correct. Yeah, yeah, that's me, yeah. So it's my job uh, from both a brand and product perspective for Microsoft Advertising to look after all of the things that we do uh, in search and then the wider digital marketing as well. And you're going to be talking about reframing uh, the, the future global marketing trends. So I'm mostly talking, this is actually reframing the future with regards to artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence. Oh, we are waiting to hear about that. And of course, we have also our uh, guest panelists here. We have Laura Crimmons, the founder of uh, Silverton Agency. Yes, exactly. Welcome. And we have Rick Rodriguez. Back again. Back again. <laughs> That's a good one. And he's the, an SEO consultant at GEC. So let's start with the presentation. Go for it. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me today. So, yeah, so I wanted to talk about artificial intelligence and really sort of set this idea of the subject about, we, we often think, I think, about AI and what we hear is the kind of the Hollywood version of AI. Uh, and typically in the minds of consumers, that comes down to one of two kind of appreciations of what artificial intelligence is and what that means for the future. So, you know, the, I think on the nice side of the spectrum is, is the benign AI, right? Which is, I think for me, best typified by the, the Disney movie WALL-E. This is where, you know, humans have got to a stage where actually they don't need to do anything for themselves. AI has taken over everything, takes care of everything for them, and they can just be very fat and lazy and don't have to think about anything. But then on the other side of the scale, we have the kind of the Terminator hostile AI. And, and I think the problem is, is that with both of these extremes, neither of these paint a particularly pretty picture for the future of what AI can achieve and how we're going to sort of move forward with this incredible technology. Um, and so I think part of the problem is that we are always framing this as, a, as an argument of like man versus machine. It's always this competitive environment. Um, if you think about the sort of the, the big news stories of um, when we think about AI, it's always as AI was able to beat a chess grandmaster at chess or um, the Google DeepMind beating the Go master in, in a game or whatever it is, we're always setting it up as this like us versus them. And it's always this competition about can AI be better than us and replace us? And so, you know, just as for fun, we created this, this um, thought experiment to say, you know, could we have a look at uh, something which is uh, inherently quite creative like poetry? Uh, and I was talking to, to some of the, the panelists sort of earlier and say, if we, we take two different poems, one written by uh, the American poet Emily Dickinson and then one written by an AI, could we tell the difference between the two poems? For the people that, uh, you know, watching, we've got the two up on, on screen. But like, if I asked you guys quickly just to, you know, which of these do you think is the one which is written by, by the machine? So, so I thought poem A, um, my reason being, it's got quite a lot of repetition in there. Yeah. And I was saying, in my experience, looking at things that are generated by machines, they tend to get quite repetitive in the content that they generate. But it was a tough call. Yeah, yeah, it was, in, it was tough. Um, I was a classical literature student a long time ago. So for me, I noticed some of the patterns in B. Mm -hmm. I thought, possibly, I don't see how a machine would know those patterns. 
uh, because of you know, formulaic poetry. Um, so I then went for A, but it was really no basis in terms of the words, etc. It was almost like a 50-50 guess for me. It was very, very close. Yeah. And so actually A is the one which is written by the, the machine, but really what, we, what we're seeing here, I think, is that we're getting to a stage where even with something quite creative, a machine is able to make a pretty good stab at things, and it's quite difficult to tell the difference. But really what I want to get away from is this thought process of us thinking about it as like us versus them, humans versus machines. Like why couldn't this be collaborative versus combative? And that's really what I think this idea of reframing the future is. Rather of thinking of AI as being a threat, what if it was there to help us? And, and that's really sort of Microsoft's view of how we see AI developing in the future and how it's going to help us, is rather than being something which will replace humans, how can it augment what we're already doing in order to make us more uh, productive and to free us to be more creative? Now, one of the key things for how we're going to achieve that, and think about that, is um, through this idea of democratizing AI. And um, this really is about, there's only a handful of companies, I think, you know, us being one of them, the Google, Facebook, Amazon, who have, you know, a, a, a real sort of play with AI right now. Um, but how can we actually democratize that and, and give it to people in a mechanism that allows them to create their own solutions? And I think Microsoft is well positioned in this. You know, our, our history as a company is all about uh, being a democratizing force for technology. If you think about the original mission of the company to put a PC on every desk, in every office, every home, you know, that was all about bringing power to the, to the people to be able to go and work on their own uh, stuff with the power of a PC. And really, we have the same idea for AI. Like, could AI be um, the next sort of big thing? And could, could we do for AI what the printing press has done for reading? So if you think back, you know, 500 years ago, in 1500 or so, there was actually only about 12,000 books total in the whole of Europe. And the, the problem was, is because they were very expensive to create, and they were all handwritten by monks. Um, and so, you know, there was a, a real shortage of people having access to um, literature. And then the printing press came along, completely democratized the process. And just 50 years later, there were 12 million books across all of Europe. And so in a very short space of time, that technology completely changed the way that we thought about, um, you know, how we access the written word. We have the same vision for AI. How can we democratize it, put it into people's hands to give them the power to go and create their own solutions? So I think when we talk about AI, it's important to say that it's like there are three different types of layers that we have. And we are um, at the sort of the first two layers, which is sort of basic pattern recognition, but also um, perception. I'm going to talk a little bit about that for the rest of the presentation. But then um, we have that third layer of, of AI, which is sort of true sort of cognition. We're not there yet, but we're, we're kind of working up to it. I think pattern recognition is really interesting, and it, machines have this amazing ability to be able to spot patterns. On the slide here, I've, I've um, just used autocomplete as a, as a simple sort of example of that. So when you type SEM rush, the machine is spotting patterns of what people have done previously in order to be able to make a recommendation that you'll find useful. Um, but then if you think about something like paid search, you know, we have loads of auto-bidding strategies which are all driven by AI, which are there to actually reduce the burden on the marketer to um, take some of that manual optimization away in order to spot the patterns and then find the, the gaps to kind of exploit. But this isn't just about sort of us and thinking about how we can use that technology for things like paid search. I think one of the examples we have here is a really interesting one a couple of years ago when the um, American government released all of the JFK files. One of the things was that there was something of the order of 60,000 pages and documents, most of them like all handwritten, and trying to process that information was virtually impossible. So actually using AI, we were able to scan and process all of those documents. And even for handwritten notes, you could then go in and find the patterns. So anytime that somebody mentioned Lee Harvey Oswald, for example, it would highlight that. And then you could index all of this amazing information very, very quickly. Um, and so like when we think about moving on to some of those things for not just pattern recognition, but thinking about perception, um, I mentioned we have a number of these free tools that people can freely use as APIs and plug in to help to create their own solutions. 
Um, one of the solutions that we offer, which is pretty interesting, is our um, the Microsoft Bot Framework. So this is using AI in a way that allows you to just build a very simple bot once, but then distribute it across a whole bunch of different platforms. And rather than us trying to make it a walled garden just of Microsoft platforms, so thinking about Skype and Bing and Teams, we also want to make sure that it is available on as many platforms as possible with partners and ecosystems that will work with us. So you can have your Microsoft bot, for example, on something like Facebook Messenger. Um, and I think this you know, drags us into an era also of, of thinking about it's like conversational chatbots. So this is here to make life easier for people. So if I think about, um, I was in Seattle last week with a few colleagues, and we were looking for a restaurant, and uh, one of the things that I was able to use was one of these chatbots, um, and clicking on the chat button, I was able to ask a question like, what vegetarian options do you have? And it brought it from the menu, just helping me to sort of make an, an informed choice. I think the cool thing is also is that you can do this really quickly. So we have a tool that allows you to make a pretty simple chatbot. Uh, we call the Q&A maker. And you can do it literally in less than 10 minutes. We're trying to make this as simple, as easy as possible for people to use. Also thinking about uh, some of these things with, with um, perception. We're thinking about the different, like your visual or your um, uh, hearing facilities. One of the things that we are um, developing in AI is the ability to um, translate. So, for example, uh, for my wife is, is from Taiwan, so she speaks Chinese. When I uh, can't understand what she's saying, I can use uh, Bing to be able to translate immediately you know, the things that she's saying if she doesn't want to uh, try and speak to me in English. Um, which does happen more than I would like. <laughs> that was a question, <laughs> yeah. Um, but we talked about this idea of democratizing AI. And so for me, this is about how do we put uh, AI in the hands of companies to be able to solve, you know, solve problems we hadn't even thought of. And so uh, one of the, the case studies I wanted to talk about was uh, McDonald's. So McDonald's had this issue with their drive through where um, they couldn't hear properly. It's a busy kitchen, noisy environment. They couldn't hear what people was, were saying. And they were getting a lot of customer dissatisfaction from the orders coming through. And it was like, you know, actually, they have to say, I'm sorry, could you repeat that all the time? So by using a, a, a voice recognition software, we we're able to help them to process that order uh, but also, as the people are talking, it's helping to organize it into the best like, deal of the day to find out what the kind of things, as they keep on adding like nuggets or burgers or whatever, adding it to their order. And we're able to then free up the person who's at the till, rather than having to focus on what, their, what the order is, they can actually focus on the customer service. And the key thing here, this is not about AI replacing the human, this is about them being augmented in their capabilities. Um, and that sort of shifts us nicely onto thinking also about visual search. So um, there's a, a photo here, uh, which you guys can't see, but, but for people at home, there's a photo of me and my family. And, and effectively, what we have is a AI which is trying to process what's in the image and read what it's, what it's going on. Uh, so the AI says that I think it's a person holding a baby, posing for the camera, and they seem happy, happy, and not very happy. <laughs> the not very happy is my daughter, who's uh, just uh, <laughs> it's like stark face on the, on the camera. But there's actually there's an incredible amount of AI in the background trying to work out what that is. The, the fact that it, it's worked out that the relationship of the people, the, the fact that, they ha that we have a baby, and then also um, that our facial expressions. This is uh, you know, a key piece of technology, and this is free for people to use uh, for um, visual recognition. Again, we thought about how can we make a business out of that. So um, in Bing, if you're searching for uh, in images, you can actually zoom in on the images and you can get recommendations for things like um, shopping products that you could find based on that image. But it's not, again, it's not about us, it's about how do we democratize that technology to help other people. And so one of the case studies that we have here with Uber is how can they use visual recognition? I and mean, then they've done this to create as part of their service uh, an ability for people to request that the drivers um, confirm their identity. So particularly, I think if you're thinking of maybe young ladies going home late at night, they want to have that safety and that feeling of security that the person who is driving them home is the registered driver. So they can request that they take a, a, a photo. It then matches that photo to the, the database to, to say, is this actually the, the person who should be driving the car? And then gives that confirmation to the customer to give them that feeling of safety. Um, so I guess like... 
we have a, this, this grand vision and scheme for what the future looks like, but I think if there are three things that people could do today that is literally democratizing AI, you can start using some of the tools that we have and the capabilities that we have within search, so things like auto-bidding and, and some of the function, and functionality there. Um, the, the cognitive services tool, so these are all free to use APIs that you can start playing with and thinking about your own solutions. And then if you just want to dip your toe in the water with something like a, a bot using the Q&A maker to make an FAQ bot is a pretty simple thing to start with today. That's it for, for me, that's my, uh, that's my presentation. Thank you for that deep dive into AI possibilities. And everything is developing so fast. And I believe that um, in the highest part of the, of the pyramid of evolution of AI, we're just gonna be there, like not even noticing. So this is kind of really, I don't know, interesting or <laughs> scary. <laughs> we all have th that feeling. So let's start with the discussion. We have a lot of questions mm -hmm. from all over uh, the world. And let's start with the, with the panel discussion with this question. How can AI empower marketeers? So how can we use this uh, already, uh, already evolving technology for being better marketeers? Laura, if we can start with you. Well, I think there's a few ways. So I've looked at it from, so I come from a PR point of view in the realm of marketing. So I'm often looking at what journalists are doing because that's who I'm targeting from a PR point of view. Um, and there's a lot of interesting things happening there where they're using um, AI to take over some of the parts of journalism that don't require human interaction to automate things, to free up our time to focus on other stuff. So from that point of view, like financial reporting, sports reporting, you know, it's all very formulaic. You don't necessarily need the creative of a human journalist to be writing those reports and the same with lots of data so that's how a lot of journalists are using it and have been doing for years and it hasn't I don't feel necessarily made its way into PR or into marketing but again it's it's something that we could be using so we still spend a lot of time writing press releases for different regional outlets and whatever it might be actually a machine can do that much better than us because once we've got the bare bones of what we need to say filling in that data and regionalizing it that is something that you know a machine can do that for us. So I think there's some stuff there. And also, kind of what you were saying about the democratizing and the translation element, mm -hmm. you know, that, all the things that are going into making translation and transcreation better, I think is something as marketers we can get better at because that can open, you know, what we're doing as marketers or as PRs to a whole new world of customers that previously wouldn't have been able to access, you know, that information, that knowledge, whatever it is that we're sharing. So I think they're some of the most exciting things that I'm seeing. We were talking a little bit before, but uh, whilst we were waiting in the in the green room, it's like I think that's one of the key points, right? Is that it's not about the AI coming and like replacing the journalists, but when we're all busy and we all are sort of time poor, you want to free up that time that uh, to to be at your sort of your best self and your most creative. And so, if there's something that the machine can do that's fairly sort of generic and formulaic why not uh, like allow it to do that and then you're free to go and do the really sort of like the hard hitting journalism and, and do the do the difficult stuff. Yeah, right, because across journalism, PR, marketing, we're all quite time poor now. You know, our resources are shrinking, people are shrinking. Mm -hmm. Not people are shrinking, but our time <laughs> is shrinking. The amount of people. So, like, taking the stuff out of the way that doesn't need a human and allowing us to focus on the yeah. things. I think creativity is one of those things, and, like, the human emotions are something that, right now, machines can't do that mm -hmm. as well as humans. And that, I think, is very true in, in journalism, but also in marketing and PR. Yeah. Yeah, and I think yeah, one of the points you mentioned around pattern recognition being one of the sort of most basic forms of using AI to empower marketing, see it across paid search with automated bidding. And I think we're, when you give humans the opportunity to do things, we're really good at some things, creativity and ideas and new thinking, great. There's things we're not good at, which is going, you know, going in and seeing thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of millions of data points and then trying to find the one that doesn't fit or the pattern between them. So I know it's obvious, but... like the whole automation, the whole pattern, like devolving the responsibility of pattern recognition to something that is way better, it's always going to be way better than a human, is mm -hmm. an interesting way to empower marketers. And, and it's something we're already doing, and we're doing in spades because you know, it's, it's taking us to the next level of marketing. And I think, I think one of those things is that as automated bidding, for example, started to come in, I, like, I know there's that, that wave of fear of like, <laughs> of what am I going to be, like, am I going to be out of a job? What am I going to be doing? But actually, like... Uh, a we, lot of we, people are asking that. Yeah. How we, you can explain that, that the AI are, are, is taking or is going to take our jobs? Yeah, and I think like that's part of the the like the reason I started the presentation by by sort of making it the extreme case by talking yeah. about the kind of 
Terminator scenario and stuff yeah. like that. But, <laughs> but um, we're all sort of constantly evolving and learning in our jobs, right? And I think we've seen with something like auto bidding, it's not like there are fewer marketers or people have been sort of removed from roles you just get to be able to spend your time more efficiently and more effectively and you get to do the stuff which is actually you know important yeah, rather no than replacing their ppc managers and yeah, no, 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 exactly. yeah exactly <laughs> exactly and so even as we think about sort of how this evolves and gets into like fully automated smart campaigns and stuff like that you know there's still going to be that need for the sort of the human intervention and i think it's the so the key point for me is very much about augmenting human capacity rather than replacing it how can you be a complement to rather than a that kind of that that friction of like one or the other yeah, yeah i think you can use you can use uh, machine learning you can use ai to you know find a person and Know, you know, know that this person you've seen over here in page search is the same person you're seeing over here in programmatic or another channel. You can use AI to stitch that journey up, but we still need creativity of humans to be able to put the right message in front of that human mm -hmm. and to engage them in a way that makes sense because we're humans ourselves. We know we're emotive beings. We know what drives us and what makes us tick. Yeah. I don't think a machine is at the point yet where it can do that. It can write great things based on patterns and logic that it's seen in other things, but it's yeah. not going to come up with the new, you know, the next big Christmas ad, mm -hmm. or and not at least at this stage. Mm -hmm. Who knows what happens in the future? Yeah. <laughs> so we have a lot of uh, marketing teams actually uh, from their offices. They are seeing us uh, today, and they're asking. For example, I have this question of uh, Katarzyna. Oh, actually, this is a comment. The fact that uh, the AI says "I think" is both fascinating and disturbing, mm -hmm. isn't it? Well, that's that would, whether it's actual thinking. Yes. Like cognitive thought. Yeah. So we actually, we did that deliberately uh, for, for like two reasons. One, uh, to try and actually set people at ease. I think, I think if, it, if it was the other way around, I mean, it said, I know that this is this, <laughs> that that's actually in some ways more unsettling. <laughs> to say, yeah. I think it's this is a little bit more human, I think, and, and, and humanizes the- It's close the, to vulnerability. Yeah. And yeah, but also, um, you know, we also know that these, these things are, are not perfect yet. And so if it says, I think it's this, that leaves the, the door open for it to be wrong and for you to correct it. And actually one of the things that, Typically, when I show that slide, or if I, if I give people like the demo and say, "Hey, like anybody can use this, and you can upload your own photo," um, they'll typically go and do it. They'll upload a photo, and then they'll say, "This is rubbish. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't capture what I what I've put in there." Um, and I think we have to be comfortable with that, and to to say like, "This is a this is basically we're teaching a machine a brand new language. This is not based on text. This is based on trying to read an image and work out what's going on. And images are like vastly more complex. Well, and some of it's subjective, especially when it comes to like facial expressions and stuff like that. You yeah. know, like ha sometimes you can't e like I can't even tell whether someone was happy in a photo. Yeah, yeah, not. yeah. It's like those things where you upload and you get your celebrity lookalike, and it's like <laughs> like some people are going to be really happy with what they get given, and yeah. then sometimes you get yours and you're like. I don't look like that. That's yeah. unfair, even though maybe technically my features say that I do look like that. But the machine, like the, the algorithm is constantly learning, right? So the, the point of that is that we, put a, we actually put a star rating at the bottom. And so if you get a poor result, we want you to give it one star because then it can say, okay, actually, I've, I've missed something there. Yeah. But if it gives a great result, then you give it five stars because that then like reinforces that it's doing the right thing. I think these things are, you know, we're still actually at a fairly sort of nascent stage mm. despite all of the things that we talk about and there are amazing advances. There's so much more to come, but we, the more that we kind of engage with these things and allow the algorithms to develop and get smarter and get better, yeah. the better that it becomes for everyone. And I think, I think voice is a really interesting example of this because I know a lot of people are sort of looking at and there's been a whole trend of how do I optimize for voice search. Mm -hmm. But actually what you're trying to do is optimize for a point of mo a moment in time where someone gets an answer. And as soon as that person says, yes, that was the right answer or no, that's the wrong answer, voice has fundamentally changed for every single person from that point onwards. And it's always changing because all people are always asking questions, people are always answering. Um, so I think, I think it's, 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 it's really interesting. Um, just, just, you know, the technology we have at this stage 
it doesn't know, it thinks, and we are training it. And there has to be an understanding in the world, and perhaps we don't, we don't, we're not fair enough to the CAI or to the systems behind it, mm -hmm. to because we expect it to know, and it only knows from the fact that we say no, you're wrong, and it learns, and it learns, and yeah. it learns. Yeah, I think I think it's very much like AI is is actually a bit like a child, and and it will it will kind of learn and develop, but it also responds very much to what what you give it. So if if you just leave it to its own devices and hope that it will just organically pick it up, that's not going to happen. You have there has to be a, a, a some mentoring and, and training as well. And the implementation of uh, AI into a marketing team, for example, we were going to have new professions related to that, the AI guy, marketeer, the <laughs> a senior AI something. Uh, how you can implement this technology that we have now into uh, modern companies, modern marketing teams? So, I mean, my personal view is yeah. that that won't happen, at, at least not for, for a little bit. I th and I think if you think of, of the what I talked through and our view of AI is that it should be like we, we want it to genuinely be truly democratized to everybody. So that doesn't mean that you should have to have some kind of like uh, innate specialism or a guy or a, or a girl that you go to to say, hey, you're the you're the AI person. Can you can you fix this? Um, Everything that we see and that we, we have viewed is that actually the more people that you get to use it, the greater diversity of perspectives that you get, the quicker that you find these like interesting and innovative solutions that we could never possibly have imagined. And, and people are finding new use cases for these things all the time that is far beyond what we, what we conceived originally. So I think that if we do it right and if we make it simple and easy, like it will just become a thing that anybody can pick up and, and start to use and implement. But I mean, even today, if we think about something as simple as auto bidding for PPC professionals, everyone's using those and they're active users of AI, even if they don't necessarily realize it. So, you know, but I don't think anyone is putting on their LinkedIn profile like AI professional. Yeah. Well, and I think as well, like if you do it that way, where it's like there's an AI person forcing this stuff on, you don't have that same relationship that you were talking about where it's people working with machines if it feels like it's forced on you. That type of thing always causes friction. So I think it's very much going to be up to the different professionals in the different areas to recognize the benefits and then start to bring them in in different ways. Because there won't be, I don't think we're going to have one person that knows how AI can apply to every role in marketing even, let alone across a whole organization. So I see it coming down to different people in different yeah. roles starting to say, hey, this exists, we could maybe start to use this because this would help this area of our job that actually, you know, a machine might be better at supporting us with that. I think that's how we'll see it. Yeah, and we, and we have that already. So yeah, yeah. And I, it's and already like, prepared there. I guess yeah. if we just go back to that, like that McDonald's case study, if McDonald's had come, if we'd gone to McDonald's as Microsoft and say, "Hey, we've got an AI solution for you," <laughs> they they would have like immediately backed off. The the, the yeah. actually, it's the other way around. They yeah. came to us with a with a problem about we have this thing. How do we try and solve it to make our drive through more efficient? Yeah, and it was the AI that was part of the solution that helped. Yeah. It. And it's I helping think. the drive through staff. It's not taking their yeah. jobs. Yeah. Yeah. We all gonna have that kind of experience next time that we're going to McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> so so thank you very much for this session. It was a great discussion. If you want to join the discussion, so use the hashtag Global Marketing Day. A great thank you for our guest, James Mura from Microsoft, Laura Cremans, and Rick Rodriguez. Thank you very much for being here. And of course, we're gonna move to the next session, but we're gonna continue. Still, we are on air. We are live here from London.